Professor Walter Robert, pianist, lecturer, and accompanist, will appear under the auspices of Lamar University in a piano recital at 8 p.m. this evening in the recital hall of the Music Speech Building on the Lamar University campus. Professor Walter Robert is well known to audiences throughout the country, and he's with us on the campus of Lamar today. He spoke with the students just last hour. Professor Robert, thank you very much for being here with us this morning. Could we talk about the program that you're going to be giving tonight? Mozart variations on a theme by Sarti. Sarti was a minor composer of the period, and uh, variations were written at that time in order to propagandize some music the same way records are being made now. It was a way of plugging music, but I think in the case of Sarti, uh, Mozart didn't exactly plug Sarti because Sarti was a competitor. So it was more, I think, a case of uh, uh, riding on the coattails of somebody who had just written a very successful opera, and Mozart wrote these variations on the theme of Sarti. The opera has a title that uh, means something like uh, when two are uh, quarreling, a uh, bystander uh, has uh, the advantage of it. The uh, little ditty on which these variations are based uh, mean uh, 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 like a little lamb, whatever that little lamb is doing, you see. And it's not just exactly the most noble tune that you can ever imagine, and uh, the great art of Mozart comes out in what he does with this, uh, with this tune. The um, piece is probably still not uh, written for the hammer clavier for our type of piano, but probably for the harpsichord, or at least it was the transition period between the time when people had harpsichords at home and played on the harpsichord and uh, where the piano was pre still pretty new and only the most uh, advanced and rich people could afford to buy a piano. I don't think the piece uh, needs any great intellectual efforts to be enjoyed, but it is a charming, a charming little thing. Uh, then uh, our next uh, piece I play is the Brahms Sonata which has Opus I uh, as the first published uh, piece of Brahms. Actually, it is not his first sonata, it is his second sonata. And the second sonata, the Opus II, was, was uh, published uh, uh, first. And so that uh, causes uh, some confusion in people's minds. When uh, people notice that the main, uh, the main uh, uh, theme of the <laughs> has some similarity with a sonata by Beethoven, the so-called Hammerklavier sonata. You see, if you have three, it's similar to... See? And they exactly pointed it out, it's the reverse, you see? And when people pointed this out to Brahms, he said, well, he was uh, given to rather rough and ready uh, answers. He said, well, any jackass can hear that. <laughs> 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 uh, it must have been one of the pieces that he, as a young man, for I think 21, brought to Schumann and that impressed Schumann so much because it is particularly uh, true of this sonata that it is more symphonic than really pianistic. And that is what Schumann stressed in that famous article where he uh, launched Brahms for all practical purposes. Uh, he wrote, there is the new eagle uh, uh, taking off on his flight. Uh, 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 so that was one of the few cases where a musician said something good about another musician that is not too, too frequent. No. <laughs> um, second and third movement of this piece are based on the same uh, motivic material and they merge into each other. There is no pause between second and third movement. So that sometimes causes some uh, uh, confusion with audiences. So I think it would be good if, if we if keep, we, uh, this, in keep this in yes. mind. Yes. The Andante yes. and, 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 and the Scherzo are based on the same motive and uh, played attacca is the word yeah. goes, yes. Well, Brahms, of course, in his early period, wrote these big, huge sonata forms. He didn't continue, continue that at all. Continue that at all, no, no, this is no. This early yes. work. Right, and right, it's right. Just Full of the well, young ambitions and completely very much, yes, very overpowering very, work. Overpowering work, work yes. Uh, Professor Robert will be playing on our new Steinway Grand in the recital hall, and it, I want to caution you now that it has not been played very much since we have purchased it. It's a brand new instrument, and we're quite proud of it, and we hope yes. that uh, it will uh, meet with your approval. Oh, I'm sure it will. Yes. Yes. Uh, then for the second half, is there an intermission? I well, I don't know. I mean, yes, I, I think one needs to. Yes, to, 
wife wants noble brow and <laughs> <laughs> after the Brahms, certainly you will have to uh, take a break because that is such a monumental it's work. a monumental piece yes yes the Debussy preludes uh, from book two yes while the Ondine is one of the many uh, uh, pieces inspired by the legend of the water uh, nymph uh, who uh, fell in love or with, with whom a mortal fell in love and she dragged him to her abode in the deep and of course by falling in love with a mortal she lost her immortality and there are quite a few pieces and, and songs and even an opera based on the motive of the Undine, you see, of the water nymph. So that's a little, that's Debussy's treatment of that, of that well-known romantic story. And then the Perta del Vino, the second piece that I play, is a, one of the many Spanish-inspired pieces of Debussy. Uh, and it's interesting to uh, realize that Debussy was never in Spain, had never set foot uh, in Spain, and wrote the most Spanish music that one can imagine. It is, in a way, more Spanish than the Spanish composers, uh, his contemporaries, Alvinis and Granados, uh, wrote. Uh -huh. So it's, it's a, one of those cases of genius, uh, really? where, where okay. intuition and, and, and fantasy went beyond the actual, actual uh, sound of the music. Uh, Perto del Vino is one of the sections of Seville. Uh, oh, that is what, what is the title in, uh, implies. Well, I was aware of the situation with the composition of Iberia and his orchestral works, that yes. he had never set foot never in Spain, foot and in here Spain. is this yes. exciting yes. Spanish yes. music. Yes. Yes. And yes. Yes. It really is yeah. Yeah. quite remarkable for the man from yeah. uh, France. Exactly. Yeah. background. Yes. 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 Uh, Spain exerted a, a tremendous pull on, on, on composers from abroad. Uh, the Russians had, yeah. had their hang up on Spain, and Spain was sort of the never never land for, for, these, uh, for this generation. It was still pretty much isolated, it was hard to get there, uh, and even when I, when I first came to Spain, uh, uh, it was difficult to cross the border, and the Pyrenees are pretty high, and, and uh, you can't get through very much, and then you know that the, the rails are different in Spain, uh, they, are, they have a wide gauge rail, so you have to change trains oh. at your own, and even to this day it's a little bit off the, the beaten path, yes. <laughs> For your final work, you'll be performing the Ballade in F minor, Opus 52, by Frédéric Chopin. This is an also a very uh, exciting mm. piece and a fitting conclusion, I would think. Well, I would hope so, yes. It's, it, the four ballades of Chopin are among his most, uh, most important uh, compositions, and the first ballade in G minor was, uh, again, a piece that Schumann uh, made famous and uh, about uh, which he wrote an article starting with the words, Heads of a Genius. Uh, the fourth ballade is, in contrast to the other ballades, probably not based on an actual poem. The other ballades are supposedly at least inspired by poems of a um, Polish compatriot of Chopin, Adam Mickiewicz, who is one of the most colorful figures of the Romantic period. He was an emigre, just like Chopin himself, but more than that, he even founded a Polish legion in, in uh, Western Europe and led it uh, successfully, or more or less successfully, in, in, in the Napoleonic Wars uh, against Russia. Uh, Mickiewicz um, lived uh, all over Europe, uh, in fact, in, in Florence. I had a sabbatical at one time which I spent in Florence and I passed by a house and every other house in Florence has a tablet with a name uh, who lived there anyway, but uh, one of the tablets <laughs> yeah. was Adam Mickiewicz, <laughs> the suit of Greek. <laughs> and uh, so this uh, ballad, however, supposedly is not based on the Mickiewicz poem. We do not know whether it uh, has any poetic inspiration or not. Apart from that, it is one of the most perfect uh, sonata forms uh, that Chopin ever wrote. It's a better sonata structure than even the, sonata the sonatas, sonatas themselves. Yes, yes. Like the. Uh, like can we talk about form now for Chopin? Uh, well, uh, some, uh, you know, he has written impromptus, yes. a fantasy piece with yes. no structure at all, but. Then we look I'm at a... Sorry, I disagree okay. with you. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping when we were talking about a... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the common saying is that uh, Chopin uh, did not know how to handle sonata form. That is unfair. The uh, sonata form, of course, had been exploited, uh, if you want to put it that way, by Beethoven, to such an extent that very little was left with the original uh, idea of the sonata. And the original idea of the sonata was to combine key contrast and 
dramatic development. That is the idea of a sonata. You see, now the, the romantic composers are lyricists. They, they come from the song. They, they, they are ma mainly thinking in terms of, of uh, singable melody. And of course, that doesn't go for dramatic contrast, you see, so they had to modify the sonata form. And uh, it is true that they were better in the smaller forms than in this huge demanding, uh, demanding form where you have to carry on the musical thought for a matter of five or six minutes, and five or six minutes of music are long, you see. So uh, he modified the sonata, and when he returns to the, uh, to the what is called the restatement, he usually avoids repeating the main thought, and he goes immediately into the so-called contrasting theme. Mm -hmm. So that is one deviation. And then, of course, he had other, uh, tried at least other solutions. You see, he combines the sonata form of exposition, development, and, and restatement with a scherzo form, you see. So instead of having a development, he has a trio. He does that in one of the scherzos, you see. Mm -hmm. But to say that Chopin didn't know how to handle the sonata form is, is probably a little bit uh, an, an yeah. overstatement. He was a craftsman of the first order in the small forms, and nothing is as finely wrought and as beautifully worked out as his small pieces. And there he is of an infinite uh, inventiveness and ability to vary the, the form, the thought, the harmony, the, the, the ornamentation, the rhythm. In the, in the larger forms, of course, he was oppressed in a way by the model of Beethoven, whom he studied uh, very, very thoroughly, and whom he knew very well. Uh, not uh, to mention that he that he played the Weltemper Klavier all his life. But of course, he was under under the shadow of the Titan, so to say, and that is a title of a novel that was written at the time. You see, under the shadow of the Titans, and 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 of course, it was difficult for these composers to to come up to that to that overpowering and and towering genius of of Beethoven that had just preceded them.